The Pirates of Darkwater Fondly looking back at this underrated 80s cartoon, Mur is an extraterrestrial world plagued by evil. The only thing that can stop the encroaching darkness and the ruthless pirate lord who seeks to control it is a motley crew of unlikely heroes, an orphan prince of a formerly powerful kingdom, the last of his line of ancestors, a seasoned pirate whose obsession with treasure hit a heart of gold, a mysterious ecomancer with ties to a realm beyond mortal men's reach, and a strange creature called a monkey bird. Quiet, Nidler! Why you tell my stomach to stop growling? These were the Pirates of Darkwater, introduced by the famous cartoon company Hanna-Barbera and developed in 1991. Before we go on to our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. <laughs> What was the show all about? The Pirates of Darkwater is a Hanna-Barbera produced American fantasy animated television series developed by David Kirshner. The series debuted on Fox Kids in early 1991 as a five-part miniseries. The first season aired on ABC from September through December 1991 and consisted of 13 episodes, including the original five-part miniseries from 1992 through 1993. The second season of only eight episodes aired in syndication in the United States. The Hanna-Barbera president and CEO David Kirshner based the series on a concept he had as a youngster, inspired by the works of Robert Louis Stevenson and the drawings of Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth. With each half-hour episode costing $500,000, the initial five-part miniseries was the costliest animated production Hanna-Barbera had taken on up to that point. Each half-hour episode had 20,000 cells, which was double the quantity of the classic Saturday morning cartoon series during that time. The animated series revolves around Darkwater, a malevolent liquid that is devouring the extraterrestrial world of Mur. Only Ren, a young prince, can put an end to it by recovering the 13 treasures of Rule. His devoted team of misfits include Ecomancer Tula, a monkey bird, Niddler, and treasure-hungry pirate Eos. The ruthless pirate king Bloth will go to any length to obtain the wealth for himself, posing several challenges for Ren and his crew. Mur is a planet considerably different from Earth, having its own species of intelligent animals, such as the monkey bird and leviathan. There are 20 seas around the globe, and the majority of the crew's stops are at islands. Myrrh is constantly changing, like the river of spiky rocks that rises from the ocean in the first episode and appears to defy science. Aside from the danger, none of the protagonists are perplexed by these spectacles, although it is unclear if this is the result of the dark water or the nature of the geologically active planet. Octopon was formerly the largest city on Myrrh, referred to in episode 14 as the gem in the crown of Myrrh by a figure named Ios, but it lies in ruins until Ren gathers the first seven treasures. After that, it was primarily repaired. Octopon appears to have been decades ahead of Mer's current technical status, yet civilization is likely to be in constant decline owing to the dark water pouring from the planet's core. Why am I not surprised? Look out! Exploring a few episodes in the overall story arc. In the first episode of season one, when a young adolescent named Ren saves an older man from a storm. The older man reveals himself to be his father, Primus, king of Octopon. This is how Ren discovers that he is the heir to the throne of Octopon. When the cowardly monkey bird kidnaps Ren and brings him to the terrible pirate Bloth, commander of the most dreaded pirate ship Maelstrom, Bloth becomes Ren's adversary, and he sets out to enlist a crew while Ren embarks on a journey to locate the 13 treasures of rule. In the second episode, Ren and his crew outmaneuver Bloth's colossal ship and flee through the Atani's maze-like tunnel. They are apprehended and taken before the monarch of the underground city, while Ren befriends the albino king. The mysterious Ios and Tula both have their own agendas to overthrow him. Tula takes some mysterious documents from the royal library, while Ios steals riches from the castle. This blatant abuse of the Atani king's trust nearly kills our heroes. Upon learning of their sins, Ren surrenders himself his crew and his ship to the king's mercy. Ren's unselfish, honorable gesture causes the monarch to take pity on our hero and frees the entire team, on the condition that they never return to his realm. Bloth's right-hand man, Kong, who has been tracking them down, wounds Ren with a crossbow and flees with the compass and the first treasure of rule. In episode 3 of season 1, Kong leads the wraith to an isolated port surrounded by impenetrable vegetation. A big tribe of monkey birds have been enslaved by a gang of wicked humanoid aliens on this island. Ren and Nibbler diverted from their intended mission desired to assist in the release of the monkey birds. According to Ios and Tula, Ren is being silly and naive. After all, there are treasures to be found. The once loyal gang disbands. Ren appears to have been slain when Ren and Nibbler incite an uprising among the monkey bird slaves. Ios and Tula set out in pursuit of Kong. They both feel terrible, wondering what they might have done to help Ren. Meanwhile, the tide of the rebellion has shifted in favor of the monkey bird, and their imprisoned queen has been restored to power. 
Ren and Nibbler are rewarded by the king with the gem on the front of her crown, the second treasure of rule. Ren and Nibbler set off in pursuit of Ios and Tula. Unfortunately, a giant sea leviathan destroys their ship. Ren and Nibbler float aimlessly in the middle of the ocean until they spot a ship, the Maelstrom, Bloth's battleship. In episode 4, Bloth captures Nibbler. Ren is also introduced to one of his father's most trusted commanders. Among Bloth's other inmates, Ren encounters one of his father's assistants, a lady named Avagon. Ren and company track some robbers down to the island of Pandawa, home of the monkey birds, with both the compass and their first treasure taken. The island is in the grip of an insurrection as Nibbler's people fight to be free of the slaver's clutches. Ios and Tula pursue Konk to Janda Town, where they reclaim the compass and first treasure with the assistance of Ios's friend Zuli. But Tula has her own plan and takes them, carrying them to Bloth. In the fifth episode, which is also the season finale, Tula has sold not only Bloth the first treasure, and the compass, but also his heart. Tula is handed command of the Maelstrom once she has delivered the items. Ren declares that despite this betrayal, he will succeed. They plot an escape with the other captives. Meanwhile, Ios and Zuli have healed and want to get on board the Maelstrom to exact revenge on Tula. The duo confronts the Maelstrom and nearly steals the first treasure and accomplice for Ren. Zuli swims away, but Ios is apprehended and fastened to a hefty post on deck for all to see. Baloth gloats after his final win against Ren and begins making arrangements to collect the remaining treasures. That night, as Ren escorts the convicts away, they are astonished to see Tula risking her life. Her sole motivation has been to free Theron, one of Bloth's prisoners. Theron is an expert in environmental healing, and Tula has gone to him to preserve her home island. Massive pools of nasty dark water indicate that the entire planet is slowly dying. Tula's island's conditions have deteriorated, and the residents require Theron's healing abilities. Tula's rescue preparations are foiled, and a massive struggle ensues between Bloth, Ren, and the prisoners. Ren is reunited with Tula and I in the last fight. The trio reclaims the compass and the first treasure, then sets fire to the maelstrom. As the smoldering Bloth extinguishes the ship's fires, the Wraith sets sail into the night with the crew that is now wholly committed to Ren's mission. Ren holds up the compass as they sail in pursuit of the third treasure of rule, having gained the respect of the others, and more importantly, himself. Look out! Marvelous Verdict, a terrific show while it lasted. The short-lived animated series The Pirates of Darkwater stood out among the millions of cheesy, silly, and just plain dull cartoons that came out of the 1990s. This was a fantastic series that was partly Star Wars, part Thundar the Barbarian, and partly inspired by a couple of 1940s swashbuckling flicks. The Pirates of Darkwater was distinctive in its own right, and it stood out from the crowds of cartoons that were popular in the 1990s. It had an interesting concept. The Pirates of Darkwater has to be one of the most underappreciated animated programs of all time. It's a lot of fun, distinctive, and original. Unfortunately, the program was canceled before the tale was entirely completed. Thus, it was a great tragedy that something so fantastic ended up feeling unfinished. Having said that, the narrative premise was intriguing, as were the episode ideas centered on it. The concept of Darkwater threatening to take over the planet and a hero attempting to collect the magical objects necessary to avert it is incredibly fascinating. The soundtrack is fantastic, and the episodes are packed with adventure, hilarity, and bravery. The dialogues were also shockingly sophisticated and morally sound for a kid's cartoon. Ios, bring her around! There's nothing we can do! The animation is incredibly realistic, with vivid colors and intricate character traits and backdrops. And the characters are fantastic. Ren is a really appealing hero, similar to Luke Skywalker, and Bloth is a great foe, quite a complicated character if you think about it. Tula is also stunning. A fantastic voice cast brought these personalities to life, particularly Brock Peters as Bloth. Once I have the 13 treasures of rule, you can see to the planet's rebirth. Who exudes danger, but also Jody Benson, George Newbern, Frank Walker, Hector Elizondo, Jim Cummings, and Tim Curry. In conclusion, we believe that this is a genuinely outstanding program that has been handled unfairly. It is superior to the vast majority of animated series that are now being broadcast. Looking back at some memorable characters. When it comes to our heroes, Rin, played by George Newbern, is the prince of the formerly powerful kingdom of Octopon and the series' primary protagonist. He wields the entirety of the Shattered Sword that belongs to his father. He had liberated one half of the planet from the Dark Water by the second part of the first season. Rin was fostered on the borders of his nation by a lighthouse keeper, oblivious of his destiny and lineage. Nidler, played by Roddy McDowell in the miniseries and Frank Walker in the TV series, is a monkey bird that initially belonged to Bloth, before fleeing by assisting Rin's escape from the pirate captain. He is from the Pandawa Island. Nidler is typically portrayed as a little greedy and continuously ravenous for food, his favorite food being Minga melons. <laughs> Lunch! 
lunch is served. <laughs> However, he adores Rin, and his ability to fly proves to be helpful on occasion. Tula, played by Jody Benson, is an echomancer with the capacity to control the elements and biological life, both conscious and non-sentient, with a natural fondness for the environment and animals. She is abrasive and frequently irritates another character named Ios. Tula is introduced as a lowly barmaid, but she stows away on Ren and Ios' ship, stating that she wants to escape the monotony of life on land. She quickly reveals herself to be a character with many secrets. Ios, who was portrayed by Hector Elizondo in earlier episodes, and then Jim Cummings, is a rogue and pirate, who initially joins up with Ren for the promise of wealth. Throughout the season, his character develops, and he grows fond of Ren and his ideals, becoming a protective brotherly figure to him, and frequently sacrificing his life for Ren and the treasures. However, he continues his endeavors to get wealthy rapidly, but he is generally unsuccessful. Solia, Ios' younger sister, also features in the series. He, like Nidler, started off working for Bloth, but it ended badly according to him. Teron, played by Dan O'Hurley, is a superior ecomancer who sprouts roots from his body to refresh himself from a portable supply of local soil while he is away from Andoros. He appears in the series for the first time as a prisoner aboard Bloth's ship, and Bloth utilizes his strength for evil, draining the surrounding environment and his positive life energy. Tula admires him as an ecomancer, and she was tasked with bringing him back to Andoros to help cure the Darkwater Ravaged Island. Terran also assists Tula in adjusting to her new talents as an ecomancer when they first appear. Coming to the villains, Bloth, played by Brock Peters, is the ox-sized humanoid pirate commander of the fearsome pirate ship Maelstrom and one of the series' main adversaries. Bloth seeks the 13 treasures of rule in order to rule all dark water in the world, and hence Myrrh itself. He destroyed Primus's fleet 17 years before the show's chronology and caught Primus and his aide, Avagon. However, the seven captains following Primus managed to escape with the treasures. Bloth has since been compulsively seeking them and eradicating every relic of the House of Primus, including killing every successor to Octopon's throne he could discover, and trashing and pillaging the dying Metropolis. He held Primus imprisoned for 17 years before releasing him to Octopon and Ren. He redirected his intense hate of Primus to Ren after finding that he had a son. Bloth proceeded to pursue the kid throughout Mer's 20 seas, in order to acquire the treasures and destroy Ren and the Primus family. In the second part of the first season, he forms an uneasy and distrusting collaboration with Morpho, a prominent Dark Dweller agent. The Dark Dweller, played by Frank Weller, is one of the series' main adversaries. The Dark Dweller is a terrifying evil monster who created the Dark Water. He initially dispersed the treasures since their strength is the only thing capable of fighting him and his terrible grand plan to engulf Myrrh in Dark Water. Morpho, played by Neil Ross, is the Dark Dweller's servant and the commander of his followers, the Dark Disciples. He joins forces with Bloth and serves as the Dark Dweller's above-water liaison so that they may help each other in their joint aim of eliminating Ren and his comrades. Despite the fact that they have very different intentions for the compass and treasures. He was an alchemist working on dark water research when the Dark Dweller caught him and altered him such that he was no longer totally human, turning him into an immortal servant. He has a tentacle in place of one arm, and half of his torso has been molded to seem like a mashup of deep sea monsters. He describes himself as being from two worlds, Wren's and the Dark Dwellers. Are the chances of a reboot bright enough? Aside from avoiding the 30th anniversary, it's Disney who is making the strongest argument for Warner Brothers to embark on their own high seas voyage as soon as possible. In 2003, Disney decided to release a big budget, waterbone, pirate themed adventure film based on Pirates of the Caribbean, a decades old attraction at its theme park. On paper, it was a really stupid notion. Waterworld had sunk less than a decade before owing primarily to the high cost of making movies with a significant water component. So what are the chances of a new Pirates of a Dark Water film seeing the light of day? All things considered, Disney's investment paid off handsomely. The Pirates of the Caribbean film franchise alone is currently on track to gross $5 billion globally when the upcoming sixth feature and the spinoff are included. That doesn't even take into account the remainder of the series' licensing arrangements. Never one to let lightning strike only once, Disney sought to rekindle success with Jungle Cruise, a new ride-inspired, franchise-launching adventure film starring Dwayne Johnson. Disney now owns two water-based brands inspired by attractions that are more than 50 years old, but Warner Brothers has been sitting on its own original untapped IP for the previous 30 years. We know Warner Media isn't afraid to explore established IP for modern reboots. The top brass reflects on prior accomplishments, but Warner Brothers appears hesitant to take massive Disney-sized swings with their own IP. A Pirates of the Dark Water revival might prove everyone wrong. If done well, it may also satisfy stockholders. The majority of the characters are persons of color, both heroes and villains, 
and they come in different forms, sizes, power sets, and persuasions. Only the vilest of the evildoers are linked with the Dark Water's malevolent aim, and the world as they know it is slowly being devoured by an incredibly dangerous environmental catastrophe. The watery planet of Myrrh is divided into classes in the same way as our world. Magic and mystery can be found in plain sight, among coves and islands, deep in the world's rainforests, or in the seas of Myrrh itself, with endless possibilities. An adventure awaits around every turn as the wind whisks the pirate crew of the Wraith away in pursuit of wealth to drive the dark water back into the deep, keeping one league ahead of the pirate lord Bloth and his gigantic ship, the Maelstrom, wherever and whenever they can. Furthermore, if someone really intelligent develops the perfectly gorgeous baby monkey bird, Warner Brothers may have their very own baby Yoda on their hands. They could literally take the Pirates of Dark Water structure and plot from 1991 and adapt it to today's environment without missing a step. It may even be for better for having withstood the test of time for 30 years. In doing so, Warner Brothers would be giving one of animation's most treasured diamonds a chance to shine. Get away, Titan! <laughs> Conclusion The Pirates of Darkwater was a fun and exciting animated TV series while it lasted. With a host of interesting characters and storylines and a unique premise, the animated series debuted at a unique point in time. The transition from the 80s to the 90s was a fantastic opportunity for creative forces to either revive an existing game for the decade's extraordinary thirst for material, or to come up with something fresh that could be the world's next great franchise. It's a pity that the series was short-lived though because there were many who held great interest in it and the cartoon had incredible potential, even to this day. Fans of the cartoon show are waiting hopefully for a reboot with bated breath. Did you enjoy the video? If yes, then don't forget to like and comment on this video. Till next time, goodbye and have a great one. Not alone, Ren. It is now our destiny too.